Welcome to episode 10 of Will's Guide. We're going to continue the R6RS training arc. A uh, comment about this. So we're going to read page by page, example by example, paragraph by paragraph, word by word, the R6RS scheme spec, at least the first 60 pages or so, until we get up to the semantics. We're going to read it all. Now, I mentioned this to a friend whose response was, wow, those are going to be boring. Those are going to be the most boring videos ever made. Possibly. If you like Scheme, like me, if you are a Scheme aficionado, otaku, geek, then it's not boring. Uh, the best definition I've heard of a geek is you're a geek when you love something so much that every detail matters. So I am a Scheme geek from that standpoint, so it's not boring to me. I actually love it to learn more about Scheme. And if you're watching this video, you also might be a Scheme geek or a programming language geek. The other thing I'll say is I'm very interested in how people get good at complicated skills. And I've watched a lot of interviews about people who are professional StarCraft players get good at StarCraft, like really good, you know, uh, international tournament level good. And one thing I've heard over and over again is that if you really want to get good at StarCraft, you have to be okay with doing things that other people would consider boring. You have to be able to do things like practice the same opening against the computer a whole bunch of times in a row. And that could be boring, you know, it's like we're going to practice the exact same thing over and over and over again, and we're going to time ourselves and watch the replay and see what our supply is at 12 minutes. And we're going to keep doing it until our supply hits a certain amount at a certain time. And we can do that consistently. Well, to some people, that's completely boring. Completely boring. You're just doing the same thing over and over again until you can't make a mistake. However, that's exactly what's required to get to the highest level of something like StarCraft. And I think it's similar if you're <clears throat> trying to learn something like Scheme, you'd better really understand how cons works and what a list is. And you'd better be able to cons up, you know, lists and tree structures, you know, uh, and write recursive functions where most of the time you just do it without making a mistake because you're going to have to do it so often that if you're constantly fumbling around with the fundamentals, it's going to be painful. You're going to spend a lot of time dealing with parentheses errors if you haven't figured out how to set up an editor, how to write programs in such a way where you don't make those classes of errors. So, you know, those fundamentals are important. And this is one reason I'm trying to make so many videos. I'm trying to understand this process. How do I have to deal with things like sound levels in YouTube and, you know, dealing with fan noise from my computer, all this, all these little things uh, that turn out to be important. You just do it a whole bunch of times. Some, some people just find it completely boring. Well, that's fine. Um, the people who find this extraordinarily boring, most of them probably not going to be that great at Scheme. Let's be honest. All right. So let's be bored. We're going to be boring. We're going to embrace the boredom. The most boring videos on YouTube. That is our goal. I'm going to make a whole series. We're going to read every single word of the R6 RS standard together. We're going to go through every single example. We're going to try running them in Shea Scheme. And I'm actually going to open up the standard. Let me try it this way. Let me try opening up the HTML version and the PDF version. I'm just, I'm not going to look at the library part of the spec. I'm just going to look at the report. Okay. So we have the HTML version and we also have the PDF version. You know, for copy and paste, I don't know which is better. Sometimes when you copy and paste things from the web into Shea, you know, weird, weird stuff happens. So, you know, we'll just be careful with that. All right. Which one looks better on screen? I'm not sure. Let's start with Eh, let's start with the PDF version for now. If that gets too annoying, we'll switch. All right. 
R6RS, first video for the first page. Yeah, let's stick with the PDF version because I want to keep tra track of the pages. I'm not even sure what the pages mean on the uh, HTML version. Page one, video is really the first video on it. Revised, 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 revised report on the algorithmic language scheme. Revised at six power. The name of this report reminds me of ALGOL, in particular, the ALGOL 60 report. ALGOL, which was algorithmic language developed in Europe, but included computer scientists uh, from the United States as well. Um, that was maybe the most influential language of all time. You know, Lisp would certainly be up there. But ALGOL 60, uh, for languages that most programmers have never heard of, I would say is the most influential language of all time. This report, I think, is is inspired at least to some extent, and and certainly the scheme language and design of scheme is inspired to some extent by ALGOL 60. So ALGOL 60, if you haven't heard of that, def definitely recommend you learn about you can learn about ALGOL 60. There's a great series called the History of Programming Languages. Um, so ACM Press has uh, a number of of volumes on this. I, I had Hopl 2, History of Programming Languages, Volume 2. Uh, that was one of the first books that really got me into programming languages. I got Hopl 2 and just tried to read everything I could. I think Hopl 2 has uh, an entry on, on Algo. It's either in Hopl 1 or Hopl 2. But um, anyway, we are going to look at this report. And so we have some editors here. Um, okay. Mike Sperber, Kent Divig, Matthew Flatt, Anton von Stratton. Those are editors. And also acknowledged are the editors from the R5 report, the earlier report. And we have the authors of the formal semantics for R6. So Robbie Findler and Jacob Matthews. Okay, so there's a formal semantics that are part of the report. And these are an operational semantics as opposed to R6, sorry, R5, which had a Denotational semantics, and I think a lot of people weren't happy with the denotational semantics. You know, we'll talk about that later. So, September 26, 2007, the scheme, uh, the R5RS report for comparison came out in 1998. So, uh, took took nine years to go between variants. Um, and the R7RS small came out in 2013, I think, so took six years to get the small and the R6 as the R7 RS large is still still going on. So these language specifications tend to take quite a while. Summary. The report gives a defining description of the programming language scheme. A defining description. Okay, so this is a definition of what scheme you know, behavior is. This is interesting to me because in many programming languages that are in common use, I don't know what the defined description of the language is. Like, I don't know, for Ruby or for Clojure, what are the defined, you know, what is the def definition of the behavior for those languages? Eh, probably whatever the implementation does to a large extent. Um, for Python, maybe the same thing. I know there are multiple implementations of Python. I don't know if there's ever been an accepted formal definition of the language. There might be descriptions of the language. There might be, you know, manuals. And there's what the implementation does. If there's an actual semantics, I'm not sure. Maybe there is. But many languages that are in common use, and popular, use popular use, don't have semantics. Java famously, you know, when it started becoming really popular... Uh, the the people who were at Sun and then I guess Oracle made a big effort to try to standardize the language and famously Guy Steele got involved in that effort and they did formalize uh, Java and in the process of formalization my understanding is they found a lot of problems with the memory model that they fixed and cleaned up and um, so you know that some some languages have a formal specification and some languages don't. Some languages have a defining documentation uh, 
you know, I think a lot of it also comes down to, are there multiple implementations of the language? Or in fact, in practice, is there one implementation that everyone considers canonical? And they go by that. You know, in the Haskell world, there is an official Haskell report, Haskell spec. Um, for a long time now, it seems like the GHC version of Haskell, which has a bunch of extensions, has effectively become standard. And I, I understand there's a new effort now to do a, an update to the Haskell standard that I think will formalize a lot of the, the behavior of GHC. There used to be other implementations. There was hugs and so forth when I started playing around with Haskell. But now I think basically everyone uses GHC. That's the sense I get as a, an outsider. Maybe I'm wrong. Let me know if I'm wrong. Um, but anyway, Scheme has many implementations. My friend Aziz Gulom uh, claimed that Scheme is the most implemented language of all time. And the reason he said that was that anyone who learns Scheme implements it. And in fact, if you get into Scheme a lot, you probably do many implementations of Scheme, at least part of Scheme. You might write a whole bunch of interpreters. The MetaCircular interpreter of Scheme is you know, a standard program and a standard artifact of study. And also writing a, a compiler for Scheme is, is uh, pretty standard. Even writing macro evaluators, which probably needs to become more standard, that's more complicated than a lot of other implementations of Scheme. Um, but the point is, if you really learn Scheme, you know, tend to uh, try to implement it some. So very uh, highly implemented language with lots and lots of, of versions of the language um, that are out there. Uh, and so it's important to have a specification and a description of the language that's precise enough that people can build an implementation that that works the way other people expect. And in fact, the history of these reports apparently started when the different implementations of Scheme diverged so much in, in how they worked that people couldn't even read the code from other Scheme implementations, and, you know, let, let alone try to write code that would run in multiple Scheme implementations. That was you know, far-fetched, but you couldn't even read the code from other people's scheme. So that was apparently the the impetus to, to start formalizing this behavior. And at this point for R6, the situation has improved to the point where now there is a, a standard library mechanism and you can actually write library, uh, or write code that runs in multiple implementations. R6 still doesn't specify a lot of behavior that you might want for programming in the large and you know there's not you know a standard thread library or parallelism behavior and you know interaction with the operating systems it's not much there so there are a whole bunch of things you might want in in a big language or or a very pragmatic language that aren't specified here but it's definitely much more specified than R5 and the library mechanism means that it's at least now much more credible to write code that can run on multiple scheme implementations. So that that was a big, uh, you know, reason to try to do R6. Also, the R5 report just didn't have much information about scheme macros, hygienic macros. So when scheme was first created, there weren't hygienic macros. So the idea of a hygienic macro had to be devised later. And so, you know, early versions of, of the revised report just don't have macros, or at least the current version of macros. And R5 just doesn't have that much detail. So, you know, there are things like macros that are important. Also, R5 had a number of either oversights or or mistakes in it. So this is a chance to report to, to fix some of those. Okay, enough for motivation. Summary. Okay, the, yeah, like, like I said, the, I got one sentence in, all right? Um, we're 14 and a half minutes in, we've gotten one sentence into the summary. Scheme is a statically scoped and properly tail recursive dialect of the Lisp programming language and invented by Guy Lewis Steele Jr. and Gerald J. Sussman. Okay, so to read that sentence, Lisp wasn't invented by Guy Steele and Jerry, but you know, Lisp was invented by John McCarthy, um, 
in, in the late 50s. But Scheme was invented by uh, Guy and Jerry, and the first Scheme report, uh, first Scheme paper came out in 1975, and so they were at MIT. Jerry's still at MIT. Um, so a scheme is statically scoped and properly tail recursive, and it's a dialect dialect of Lisp. There are many versions of Lisp. Lisp, been, Lisp has been around since the 50s. Closure is a Lisp. Racket, which I think has tried to distance itself from, from Scheme, and it was a, originally a version of Scheme. That's a Lisp. You know, lots of lots of types of Lisps, and Scheme is one Lisp. There are famously in the 1980s a whole bunch of Lisp machine companies, companies making custom hardware and computers and operating systems to run Lisp. And the common Lisp standard came out of the the vendors of that hardware wanting to have a common um, common version of Lisp that people could program to that would work across the different Lisp machines. That's my understanding of where the common Lisp uh, standard came from. So Scheme is a Lisp. It is statically scoped. Okay, what does statically scoped mean? Well, this is in opposition to dynamically scoped, I believe. And we'll talk about the difference between static scope and, and dynamically scoped. But the idea of lexical scope or static scoping in Scheme is critically important. So one of the things means is, you know, so scope, we're talking about variables and variable binding, references to variables, turns out to be very subtle. And much of the study of, of programming languages and much of the innovation in modern programming language research is around trying to, to deal with reason about the notion of, of uh, scoping in programming languages. A scheme is statically scoped. You know, lexical scope is everything, as Dan Friedman says, or just scope is everything. In scheme, you can tell from a variable reference where that variable was bound um, just from looking at the program. So you can tell that statically as opposed to having to run the program. You can do a static um, you know, observation of the just the program code. There are some properties of computer programs or scheme programs that you actually have to run the program and this is this has to do with the halting problem and decidability and things like that, undecidability. Uh, but in Scheme, you can at least tell if you see a variable reference where that variable is bound to. You can tell that statically. Now that doesn't mean you can tell what the value of the variable is at runtime, but you could tell at least where the binding of the variable comes from statically without having to run the program. That's a very important property. There's another type. Uh, of scoping uh, that we'll look at called dynamic scoping. We'll talk about that at some point. Um, but scheme is statically scoped or lexically scoped. Um, very important property, very important to the idea of scheme. Okay, properly tail recursive. All right, this is also important. So scheme is all about recursion. Scheme doesn't have you know, built-in loops like most programming languages do. If there's something that looks like a loop in the scheme, what that actually is is a form of recursion called uh, tail recursion. We'll look at that, I'm sure. I'm sure a lot of these things will be described in the report, but we can also talk about them in general. Um, all right, so scheme has uh, what's called proper tail recursion. And importantly, every implementation of scheme has to handle tail recursion properly. You know, your implementation of scheme isn't a scheme if you don't handle tail recursion properly. So what that means is if there's a tail recursive call, that call has to, you know, not allocate memory or reuse uh, memory that's on the stack. So if you have a tail recursive function, no matter how, how many times that, that function is called, can only use a bounded amount of stack space by reusing stack frames or tricks like that. Uh, that's very important because in many programming languages, if you have recursion, even tail recursion, that recursion can use an unbounded amount of stack space and your computer can run out of memory or you get a stack overflow. If you've heard of the website stack overflow that programmers have, uh, have used and, 
chat GPT famously has been trained on. Um, that's what the, the, the name comes from is from blowing the stack where you did too many calls, uh, to functions or too many recursive calls. You went too deep, used up your stack space. So many, uh, programming language implementations have a stack limit. And if you exceed that, you get a stack overflow. <clears throat> um, and if you use an implementation for which even recursive calls that are tail recursive use unbounded amounts of stack space, then it's hard to get away with using recursion. You really have to, to guarantee that you don't, that your recursion doesn't, um, isn't going to happen too many times or you're in trouble. You will, you, and in fact, on a modern machine, if your stack limit, let's say is a thousand and you have something like the laptop I'm running on with 64 gigabytes of RAM, you might exceed that stack limit and crash your program, even though you have, you know, 60 gigs of RAM left or, you know, 63 gigs of RAM left. You could have plenty of RAM left, but you've exceeded this uh, restriction on the stack size. So in Scheme, if you if you have a, a, an actual Scheme implementation that conforms to the, the standard, any tail recursive function is required to be implemented in such a way that unbounded recursion, tail recursion, um, is only going to allocate a finite amount of, of memory on the stack. Okay, so that's a really critical property. And this is quite unusual. I think this was uh, one of the few <laughs> languages or earliest languages, or maybe the first language, to uh, require that every conformant implementation use a specific strategy for implementing recursion or, or a specific technique for implementing a type of recursion. You know, normally... That's up to the uh, you know details of the implementer, um, and you know I think for the C sharp language, for example, the spec specification allows for proper tail calls, but at least the original version, I think the original implementation actually didn't guarantee uh, proper tail recursive behavior, so it wasn't safe to use this. Okay, so if you if the spec doesn't doesn't require all implementations. To, um, to implement tail calls recursively uh, and pro you know, recursive tail calls properly, then uh, <clears throat> you know you, it's just not safe to use that feature. So very important that the scheme spec requires this and very unusual. Okay, it was designed to have an exceptionally clear and simple semantics and few different ways to form expressions. Very important. So this is... You know, we'll get to this with the philosophy of, of Scheme coming up, but that's very important. So we're not going to have a gigantic language that has special cases for everything. Instead, it's the opposite. We're going to have the smallest, simplest, cleanest language possible, and we're going to have a bunch of small building blocks that compose with each other. And you can build up more complicated ideas through those composition. And this is why the macros are so important, that when you have these little building blocks you want to be able to abstract over them and build them into bigger building blocks, not just with procedural abstraction, but also with syntactic abstraction. All right. Uh, a wide variety of programming paradigms, including functional, imperative, and message passing styles, like small talk, message passing, object-oriented programming, I guess, uh, find convenient expression in scheme. And I'll also add that logic programming or constraint logic programming can be expressed. That's what we do with Minikanron. This report is accompanied by a report describing standard libraries. Okay, um, now that's the difference from R5, RS. References to this document are identified by designation such as library section or library chapter. Okay, so we we'll have to look out for that. If we see a reference to library section or library chapter, that means we have to look at the, li the standard library report is also accompanied by a report containing non-normative appendices. Okay, so normative, my understanding of the technical term, you know, normative for the standards means that, okay, the things that are required for the implementation uh, and for, you know, for an implementation to be compliant with the standard, that's part of the, you know, the, the norm or the, 
the normative documents. The non-normative documents are maybe giving context for decisions, for a rationale, some commentary, but they actually don't define the language. They're just giving you maybe useful context or ideas or hints or you know maybe talk about how you could implement something efficiently, but that's not the same as the actual requirements of the specifications. Important that we keep that distinction in mind. Okay, so a report containing non-normative appendices. A fourth report gives some historical background and rationales for many aspects of language and libraries. Okay, so so that also would be non-normative. It's not, um, you know, that's background and history and so forth. You know, the rationale is great, but you can, you know, you can actually ignore uh, both of those reports. They're not required, yeah, but they might give you some helpful idea of what what the um, what the designers or the the people who worked on this specification were thinking. People who wrote this report. The individuals listed above are not the sole authors of the text of of this report or the report. Okay, that's important because the text has been honed over years from previous reports. Over the years, the following individuals were involved in discussions contributing to the design of the scheme language and were listed as authors of prior reports. Okay, Hal Abelson, Norm, Norman Adams. Okay, I'm not going to read all these names, but a number of these people I know, like Dan Friedman, my PhD advisor, Eugene Kohlbecker, who um, apparently Dan suggested to Eugene this idea of hygienic macros, and Eugene figured out the, uh, you know, how to do it. And um, anyway, lots of uh, people who've made huge contributions to Scheme here. Some of, the, some of these people I know quite well. Some, some of these people I've never met. In order to highlight recent contributions, they are not listed as authors of this version of the report. However, their contribution and service is gratefully acknowledged. And they have... You know, obviously, uh, Jerry and Guy, for example, you know, there wouldn't be scheme if it weren't for them. So even though their names, you know, are not listed um, up here, they obviously, their fingerprints are, are all over every part of this document. Okay. We intend this report to belong to the entire scheme community. And so we grant permission to copy it in whole or in part without fee. In particular, we encourage implementers of Scheme to use this report as a starting point for manuals and other documentation, modifying it as necessary. Okay, so this is actually very interesting. Um, so, so we grant permission to copy it whole or in part without fee. Why did they? Why did they say that? Why? Why was that important? Well, first of all, you know, because of the way copyright law works, when they write this document, it that's you know under their copyright, and so they have to, you know, let explicitly let people uh, do things like uh, copy the document. They have to give them permission. So here's them giving permissions for people to copy it. The thing about the fee, I think, largely comes from what happened with R5RS. So for R5RS, there was the report you'll find if you search for R5RS, but there was also an IEEE standard for scheme which was similar to, but not identical to the R5RS report. And that IEEE standard, I think it was an IEEE standard, uh, you actually had to pay for that. All right, you had to pay money. And this is, this is common for many international standards. You actually have to pay money and it can be quite expensive to get your hands on the official spec. This is common for you know, many standards in electronics, for example. So this is, the opposite. This this fee this this uh, report is for the whole community. You don't have to pay to get your hands on it. As far as I know, there's not like an IEEE spec for R6 RS or the equivalent. Um, so this is the R6 RS, and it's freely available. And you can copy the text. You can make your own document, and you can make your own manual for your implementation of Scheme that includes part of this text. Okay, that's very important. Okay, well, after only 29 minutes and 50 seconds, uh, 
we have finished the first page, the summary, and, uh, you know, we will move on from there with the next video. Okay, thank you for listening to the world's most boring video or the most boring training arc ever uh, to be seen on YouTube or anywhere else. Only uh, 60 more of these, and then we will move on to the even more boring part of reading the semantics. Okay, talk to you soon.